Alrighty then, every pony. Here is part two of My Little Dashie a Threequel by Epic BG. The first nine chapters that I read, well, they're okay, but not as good as the other two dashies. But maybe the rest of it will change my mind. We'll see. So let us begin. Chapter 10 Flight Lessons and a Race. Every pony slowly started leaving, one by one, until it was just Twilight, Soren, Spitfire, Dashy, and myself left at the table. It seemed as if Spitfire and Dashy were eating slowly just to spite me a little bit. I couldn't help but be excited for my lessons. What were they going to teach me? My daughter, one of the Wonderbolts of all ponies, to teach me how to fly. I couldn't learn from any pony better. I was ecstatic, to say the least. I heard giggling from some pony. I turned my glance to Dashy, to Spitfire, whose face had turned red in a blush, her fetlocks against her lip. Um, Pops, your wings. Dashy pointed at me while trying, stifling a laugh. I looked to my right, then my left, only to see that both my wings were fully extended. Dashy and Spitfire both fell to the ground and exploded into laughter, leaving me confused. They both stopped rolling around and regained their composure once I walked over to them and glared them down. Uh, alright, let's go, every pony. Pops has some well-needed lessons in flying from the two best flyers in Equestria, Dashy said, resting her arm behind Stick Spitfire's neck. Ahem, Soren coughed out, looking for some acknowledgement. Three best flyers in Equestria, Spitfire corrected. Shortly after the waiter came and presented the bill, Twilight paid just as she said she would. We all left the cafe and made our way towards the field near Fluttershy's and my own cottage. Okay, Pops, watch. All you ha- All I want you to do is hover in place. It's easy, okay? Just watch. Dashy jumped up and began flapping her wings. She was hovering, seemingly without any effort at all. I tried to copy her exactly. I jumped up and, pla- and flapped my wings as hard as I could. I hovered for a few seconds, but my wings gave out. Luckily, I managed to land on my feet. My ankles cracked in response. I tried again. I flew for a few seconds longer, but still landed on the grass. I was starting to get frustrated. I tried one more time. I closed my eyes, jumping as hard as I could and flapping my wings. I didn't feel the ground. I opened my eyes and looked down. My feet were dangling a few inches above the dirt. Great job, Pops! Now, try to fly over to me. Dashy moved a few feet away from me, flying backwards towards the setting sun, casting a shadow on the ground underneath me. I began to try and move, but I just wobbled in place, barely maintaining my balance in flight. How? I asked. Dashy face hoofed. See how your wings are moving up and down now? I nodded. Move them back and fo- push forward. I tried to do what she said, only to flip over and crash down to the ground, face first. I heard muffled laughs from Soren. He was slapped no more than a second after he started. Ow, what was that for? He said, rubbing his cheek. Thanks, Spitfire, I thought while I wiped off the dirt. I jumped back up and began hovering again. I tried to fly over to her. I managed to wobble my way over to her, but I did nonetheless. Great job, Pops. Just keep moving around. It'll get easier the more you do it. The day went on, and after a few snide remarks from Soren and a few more slaps from Spitfire, and a glare in return for me, I had mastered hovering. Moving was something completely different. I could barely do it. I fell almost every time I tried. As time passed, and it slowly got darker outside, and the sun setting, I was exhausted and wanted to sleep. I took a seat in the grass, rubbing my wings in aching places I didn't even know I had. Dashy said goodbye to her friends, as they all went their separate ways towards their respective homes. We flew home together. I landed on the ground and opened the door, quickly finding the couch and landing face first into it, instantly falling asleep. It's ironic, really. I taught Dashy how to fly back when we were on Earth together. Yet now that I have wings, I forgot everything that I taught her. However, I never taught Dashy how to fly over one session. It took many times, hundreds if I remember correctly. And it was the same situation with me. I never learned how to fly within one lesson. It took many face plants, a few bloody noses, a lot, and lots of bruises, but after a week, I had the basics down. After a visit to the doctor, a legitimate therapist, in a pony pain management clinic, 
I was issued new pain medicine. It did a good enough job of masking the pain enough for me to fly without it being too difficult. And I didn't ever have those gruesome nightmares ever again. I had been laying in bed one night after a day of flight lessons with Dashie and Spitfire. I began thinking about the nightmare, how it had been an entire week since it had happened and that it wasn't repeating. As I lay there, I began to think about what caused it. It had confused and pestered me so much. I would keep tracks of my dreams, some of them normal, others not so. I soon came to realize that the dream was caused by my having wings and not being able to use them, because once I had begun the lessons with Dashie, they never happened again. Come on, Pops, wake up! I've got my first race today! Dashie began to shove me around, trying to wake me up. Um, just five more minutes, please. She started shoving even harder. I nearly fell off the couch. I sat up and rubbed the sleepies out of my eye. Okay, I'm up. I smelled food. What's for breakfast? I asked, as I wrote my aching and empty stomach. Apple pancakes, she replied. I kicked off the sheets and stretched my back, feeling every crack down my spine. I stood up and made my way to the kitchen. I took my seat at one of the chairs. There on the table was a fresh steaming stack of apple pancakes. Once Dash and I finished eating our breakfast, and we got her saddlebags packed, we were left to Cloudsdale for the race. And here's a note from the author. No, Dad did not get a wing boner. It seems like when a Pegasus gets excited, their wings go up, so that's what I'm trying to say. And I'm here to say, well, isn't that what a wing boner is? Chapter 11, First of Many Dashie unfurled her wings and took to the sky. I followed short behind her with the help of a powerful gush of wind, a jump, and a push for my own wings. She was screaming for me to catch up with her, so I did. I began flying as hard and fast as I could. The pain in my wings from the injury was almost non-existent from the incredible magic medicine I was prescribed. Flying was nearly effortless. I caught up to her and tapped her side. Tag! I shout through the wind noise as I soar away. Oh no, you didn't! She says, determined to tag me back. She flew past and over me, turning and spinning as she went. She flew backwards in front of me and tagged my nose. You're it! She shouted as she flew towards a rapidly approaching Cloudsdale. I chased after her for a few seconds until she stopped short in midair, hovering in place above the field I was taught how to fly in. The clouds moved out of the way, revealing Cloudsdale bathed in celestia sunlight. Dashie saw I was getting close and took off. She flew between the cloud homes and greek s cloud buildings that were floating through the sky, scaring ponies as she went at breakneck speeds. I wasn't too far behind her. The rainbow trail she made was dispersed as I flew through it. The mountain which Canterlot Castle was part of was now in sight. We were getting closer to the racetrack. The light gray clouds that shielded Cloudsdale once again moved in front of us, revealing a brightly lit racetrack near the outskirts of Canterlot. It was a large oval, surrounded by clouds to mark the race area. There was a lot of ponies waiting patiently in the marble bleachers that were attached to the side of a mountain, chatting about the race and patiently waiting for it to begin. We glided our way down to the stadium. Dashie made her way up to the stairs in front of me towards the locker room. On her way up the steps, I heard one young filly shouting, Rainbow Dash! over and over. I told Dashie that she was a fan. She quickly made her way over to the young filly and gave her an autograph. Her first autograph. Her first fan, aside from all her friends and myself. A few of the filly's friends began crowding around Dashie, but she soon gave them all what they wanted, a signature... A signature from the one and only Rainbow Dash. Dashie left for the locker room to change into the blue and yellow jumpsuit, which we packed into her saddlebags. As soon as she was out of sight, I, wait, I made my way to the betting stands. I hadn't made much money, but the little bit of money I had, I had earned from helping out Pinky in the bakery, Applejack on the farm, or Rarity with modeling hats. Or Rarity with modeling hats. I approached the window. Inside was a pony wearing a formal-looking suit, he seemed bored out of his mind. Hello, sir. Would you like to place a bet? Minimum bets are 40 bits, he said in a monotone voice while leaning on his right hoof. I had only brought 50 bits with me. I was debating whether or not to place the bet. I had never been one for betting. Yeah, he was. Don't you remember in the very first My Little Dashie? He, like, won a lot of money, I think, from Vegas or something? I don't remember. But anyway, whatever. Back to the story. I then realized who I was betting on. Dashie, my daughter, the best young flyer, a Wonderbolt. 
I have no doubt that she'll win, I thought. I reached into my pockets and pulled out the bag slash wallet that I kept my bits in. I pulled out my coins. They jingled against a hardwood countertop. The colt took the coins, counted them, and asked me who I was betting on. Rainbow Dash, I replied. The boy looked confused for a second, as if my bet was insane. He simply nodded, pulled out a ticket, and with his magic punched two holes in it and levitated over the yellow ticket to my hands. Phillies and gentle colts, welcome to the Wonderbolts Derby! The competitors are taking their places at the starting line and the race will begin momentarily. A booming female voice echoed. I took my seat on one of those seats near the track and waited for the race to begin. I began to watch the track. I didn't see Dashy. No more than a second after I thought that, I saw the familiar rainbow trail coming out of the door which was nearly swung off its hinges. Dashy's eyes began shifting around looking for me once she made her way to the track. I waved to her. She noticed and waved back. She flew to the track and waited for the other ponies to do the same. Are the competitors ready? The booming voice asked. One by one, every pony nodded their heads. The voice once again sounded off. Racing today, we have Spitfire. The crowd was sent to an uproar. Soren. The crowd went off again. Rapid fire. The crowd cheered yet again. Fleetfoot. The crowd screamed. And lastly, Rainbow Dash. I began cheering as loud as I could. The crowd followed in ear-shattering loud screams and cheers. I even heard the filly and her group of friends shouting, Rainbow Dash! A few seconds passed as the crowd's scream and my own died down. The horn sounded, signaling, a start, signaling the start of a race. The referee pony blew the whistle and waved the checkered black. There was a blur of blue, yellow, and white, as well as, every, as, well as the ever-persistent rainbow trail that followed Dashy. Needless to say, I don't think I've ever screamed louder in my life. The race ended so quickly, I don't even remember how many laps they flew. Rainbow Dash wins, the voice announced, followed by Spitfire, Soren, Fleetfoot, and Rapid Fire. I was so happy for Dashy. She had won her first race. The smile on her face equally matched mine, extremely toothy and goofy. I jumped out of my seat and flew over to her. She met me halfway and hugged me tight. Spitfire flew over to us, a smirk on her face. Congrats, kid, your first win, Spitfire said genuinely. Soren interjected. Whatever, I'm going to go get a snack. He was clearly bitter about the loss. I raised my eyebrow at Spitfire. He doesn't like losing. Who does? Dashy and I said in unison. I went with him, not to get a snack, but to grab my bits. The colt was still inside of his cube, bored as always. I handed him the ticket with a grin. He rolled his eyes and handed me the bits I had earned. I counted it out. 250 bits. Was that the ratio of her winning 5 to 1? They really underestimated her, I thought. It really upset me. I had more than enough bits to do something special for us, but what? Soren came back from the snack bar. He bought a slice of apple pie. It was evident from the crumbs around his mouth. Spitfire wrapped her arm around Dashie's and Soren's neck. Wanna go get some lunch? On me. Why not? Dashie said. After a very late lunch at one of Fancy Cantalot's restaurants, we decided to go out for a few drinks at one of the less fancy but still fun Cantalot bars. I'm not much of a drinker, neither is Dashy, but I don't think Spitfire is either. But we all had fun regardless. Especially Soren. He's quite the funny drunk. Spitfire is more of a classy drinker and stuck to wine. Dashy had got some cider, and I'd gotten what I think is the pony equivalent to beer. I hadn't relaxed in a while. It really felt, it felt really good just to lay back and chill out. At some point in the night, Soren had passed out right in the middle of the dance floor. To avoid him getting trampled, I brought him over to the table where he could regain himself. He said something amidst his drunk paradise. I couldn't understand any of it. it. sounded like a garbled thanks, but it came out as a groan. I took my seat across the table from the half-comatose Wonderbolt, sipping my drink. Spitfire glanced at Soren, then back at me, and I let out a snicker and let out a snicker as she walked away back to the dance floor. She walked over to the DJ and whispered something into her ear. The DJ nodded as she slowed the track, eventually bringing it to a stop. There was a tap on the microphone, grabbing every pony's attention. Hello, every pony. I would just like to take a minute of your time to toast to the newest and, clear and clearly most awesome addition to the Wonderbolt Squadron, Rainbow Dash. Every pony cheered. The floor shook under the stomping of hooves. She has faced certain death in saving my own life. 
and for that I would like to congratulate her bravery and heroism. The entire club cheered, even the bartender. Attempting to be modest, Dashley simply blushed and smiled as the ponies began to crowd around her. Questions, comments, and compliments. Lots and lots of compliments. All of them directed towards her. She could barely get a word, let alone answers in edgewise. Spitfire saw the situation. She quickly tried to disperse the ponies. Now, now, every pony, there's plenty of times for questions in the future. We all simply want to relax tonight and celebrate Rainbow Dash's victory. Please, do enjoy yourselves. Soren's eyes shot open with the announcement finished. He stood up, accidentally knocked his chair down. He pushed a crowd of ponies out of the way to get to the bathroom. He looked green in the face as he half galloped, half flew to the restroom. The music resumed as the ponies around us began to go back to drinking and dancing, all of them generally having a good time. Deshi had been dancing with Spitfire and a few of the other Wonderbolts whom had joined the party when I wasn't looking. I made my way to the bar stools in front of the bartender. I had just finished my drink. I told the bartender I wanted another, slid a few bits down the counter towards him, and he slid me back a glass of whatever it was I was drinking. As I took the glass, some pony sitting on one of the stools gave me a glare. I gave one back to him. He looked back to his glass and took a sip. Got a problem, buddy? I asked. He simply grinned. Matter of fact, I do, he said. How about you take a seat right here? He tapped the stool next to him. What's the worst that could happen, I thought. I took a seat next to him. He beckoned for the bartender to come over. He ordered two shots. He took one and slid over and slid me the other. Drink up, he said. Free drinks? Sure. I downed it. Feeling the burning and tingling down my throat as it warmed my entire body, slithering its way down. So, what's up? He rested his arm behind my neck as he rocked from side to side, humming a tune that sounded like winter wrap-up. Mmm, nothing. Just wanted a drinking buddy. Some pony to talk to. Sup with you. Nothing much. Just celebrating. He leaned into me. I backed away. His breath reeked of alcohol. He was clearly drunk out of his right mind. What you celebrating? A race victory. My daughter's. He looked down the row of stools. No mares. He looked to the tables, all which were empty. He then looked to the dance floor as he squinted his eyes. Who's your daughter? He asked, stumbling over his own words. Rainbow Dash. I pointed to the dashy amidst the crowd of dancing wonderbolts and parting ponies. He seemed to instantly sober up as his eyes shot open. The Rainbow Dash? I nodded. My daughter and I are both huge fans. He produced a wallet and pulled out a picture of the little filly. She couldn't have been a day over seven. She was the same filly that asked for Dashie's autograph earlier today at the race. She and I went to her first race earlier today. She was with her mother right now, he said with a slight pang of sadness in his voice as his head sunk down slightly. Something wrong? I asked, leaning on him like he did to me. He sighed deeply. Nah, just going through a bit of marital problems at the moment. We got separated recently. We thought it would be best for both of us to just take a break. He took another sip. What about your daughter? Joint custody. He sighed again and took a gulp from his mug. I hugged against his back, giving him what comfort I could to this pony whom I had just met no more than five minutes before. I glanced towards the bathroom door. Soren still hadn't come out. I'll be right back. Gotta go check on a friend. He nodded and I walked away. He nodded. As I walked away, I saw him order another shot. The bartender gladly took his bits. However, it seemed as if he knew the pony shouldn't be drinking much more than he already had. As I walked towards the bathroom, I started to get a bit worried about Soren. He was gone for an awful long time. He may be a bit absent-minded and cocky, but he seems like a real down-to-earth and dependable guy. I took one last glance at the dance floor. Dashie was still having fun with her friends. I walked down the short hallway and took a turn into the bathroom, only to hear the gagging and hacking of a sick pony. I opened the door ajar, just enough to scream into it. You okay, Soren? I got a cough and a groan as an answer. So, no? Blah! He hacked some more. I I'm fine. He choked out through gasps for air. Go away! There was a thud against the floor. I braced myself, took a few deep... I braced myself, took a deep breath and exhaled, preparing myself for the worst. Opened the door all the way and walked in. There in front of me was Soren, passed out in the middle of the tiled floor. I sighed and grabbed some of the roll of toilet paper from the toilet, which was covered in vomit.
A toss saw on the roll. It landed on his face. His light snoring ceased. He pulled himself up with the help of the toilet handle, thus flushing it. He looked at the roll intently. I helped him stand up, having to, near, having to nearly drag him over to the mirror. At the sight of his own face, he cleaned himself up. Gah! Thanks. He managed to speak out in a quiet and groggy voice before he nodded off again. I smirked as I picked him up and tossed him over my shoulder, hoping he wouldn't puke on me. I love you, man. Never forget that. My smile only grew as I walked to the booth and helped him back to the table where he collapsed into sleep. Spitfire and Dashie both glanced over to Soren and I. They could only laugh at his dismay. I glanced over to the bar stools. The pony was still there. I adjusted Soren's head to make sure they wouldn't choke on his vomit. Of he, of he did puke before making my way back to the stools. Sorry about that, I said, wiping off the drool from my shoulder. The pony nodded. I took my seat back next to him. Maybe you should just sit down and talk to her. Maybe you should just sit down and talk with her about it, I said. It could just be a misunderstanding. He nodded. We're becoming fast friends. What's your name, anyways? Brian, what's yours? That's a peculiar name for some pony. Well, you ain't a pony. He nodded off, having still not answered my question. We drunk in silence for a few minutes, the music being the only audible sound. Want to play a game? <laughs> Does it involve drinking? He took a few moments to respond. Yes. Then no, you've had way too many, and I'm nearing my limit. How about a later time? I glanced over to the clock that adorned the wall. It was getting very late into Luna's night, and the bar would close within the hour. I turned back to finish my drink. When I did, there was a tapping on my shoulder. I turned around to see Dash and Spitfire ho holding, holding up Soren, still unconscious, murmuring in his sleep. I sighed as I lifted him up, his snoring deafening one of my ears. Well, I've got to go. I'll see you later. Um, I didn't quite catch your name. He told me his name. I shook his hoof. Still struggling, to, still struggling to balance the sleeping stallion on my shoulder. Hopefully we can see each other in the future, when I'm not drowning myself in booze. And when I don't have to lug home a sleeping pony, he chuckled. Take care, he shouted as I turned to leave the bar. I turned back around and made sure to roll some bits over to him. More than what his and my own drinks were worth, he thanked me as he went back to finishing his drink. Best of luck with your marriage. I hope it works out. I shouted back. He thanked me and waved as I left. We all ended up staying the night in one of the hotels. We couldn't fly home with Soren. I couldn't sleep. I was just too excited. Excited for the fact that Dashie won a race. Still, I felt as if my life was complete. As if I could die happy. Having my daughter's dream come true is nothing I can put into words. It is. It simply felt amazing. It felt like life was perfect and that nothing could go wrong. I felt the same way when I found Dashie in that cardboard box all those, all those years ago. I felt the same way when I was whisked into Equestria too, both times. For a while, life was like that. Perfect. Dashie would sometimes have a race or an acrobatics performance. The Wonderbolts, as well as Twilight's other friends, would party or just hang out, and I would go along sometimes too. I would constantly be taking pictures, adding them to my aging photo album, sometimes taking time to graze over the past. Remembering most of it brought tears to my eyes. Chapter 13. Smushed Cupcakes It all happened so fast. I was flying home with Dashie. We had gone out to pick some cupcakes from Sugar Cube Corner. Dinner simply wasn't enough. Dinner simply wasn't enough, and we both wanted something sugary. What better than Pinky's Cupcakes? We were nearly home. I could begin to make out the homey wooden cabin that bordered the Everfree Forest. I fell out of the sky, the pain in my wings suddenly being too powerful to handle, all coming back instantly. I fell, twisting, turning, down. I could hear the whistling wind behind me. I could hear the whistling wind around me. If I die, I couldn't finish my thought. I'm coming, Pops! She screamed over the wind noise. I heard the click of her unhooking the saddlebags. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught the glimpse of them plummeting out of the sky. As they dropped to the ground, she bolted off towards me. I struggled to get back into the air, but I couldn't do it myself. I heard that infamous boom. I forced my neck to turn, nearly breaking it in the process. 
I saw a cyan blur speeding towards me, leaving a rainbow, leaving a rainbow in her wake. My gray feathers falling out, one by one, as I plummeted. The plucking and pulling pain was horrible. I felt individual feathers begin to get yanked out. The next thing I felt was like a speeding bullet hitting me in the chest. Dash wrapped her forelegs around my chest, struggling for, uh, struggling for both of us to land safely. Her powerful wings barely able to hold my weight, as well as hers. I extended my wings in an effort to try and help her. My wings wouldn't cooperate. I blacked out with the ground getting smaller every second. I remember waking up with two ponies trying to carry me. I don't know for certain who they were. Just seeing a glimpse of those bandaged blue wings and tattered sky blue saddlebags was enough to know that Dashie was safe. I closed my eye I closed my eyes and fell back unconscious, reassured that we were both still alive, albeit injured. I woke up warm, covered in blankets. I opened my eyes and saw that I opened my eyes and saw that Zakora was standing in front of me. I sat up, only to be pushed back with a hoof on my forehead. You mustn't dare. That drop gave us all quite a scare. She said. I agreed. I looked around for Dashie. She wasn't there. Where's Dashie? I asked in a combination of rage and confusion. Rainbow is out in the ever free, so do not be angry. Is she okay, Zakora? Do not worry. Dash is fine. She's quite a strong equine. I nodded best I could while lying down, feeling pride. The door slowly opened, revealing Apple Bloom first, then the rest of the Cutie Mark Crusaders. They each held a basket in their mouths. There were small pieces of cloth over each, so I couldn't peek inside and see what was in them. Falling behind them was Dashie. She also held a basket in her mouth. She had bandages around her wing. Blood was seeping through them. Dashie, your wings! I tried to sit up again, yet again I was pushed back down. Dashie placed the basket on the floor. I'm all right, Pops. You on the other hoof, she trailed off. My gray feathers were in small piles around me. They'd all been bent in one way or another. There were large spots missing in my wings where feathers were supposed to be. Pink flesh was in chunks all over my wings, the cool breeze of the Everfree stinging my weak skin. The Cutemark's crusaders dropped their baskets at Zakora's hooves. They trotted over to me. Apple Bloom was the first to speak. What happened? I shrugged. I told her what I understood happened. Zakora nodded her head every so often to show acknowledgement. Your wings seem to be shedding. It looks like now is the time to be acting. I knew exactly what she meant. I just didn't want to accept it. She began poking my wings, turning around and testing me. I winced in pain. Every time I did, she moved back to the cauldron. She grabbed one of the baskets off the ground. She placed it on the small table on the side of her hut. She removed the cloth, revealing some kind of flower or herb. She placed it into a pestle and mortar and began crushing and mixing it. She scraped out the fine paste and placed it inside and placed it aside. I closed my eyes, resting my head against the generous amount of pillows underneath my neck. When I opened them, Apple Bloom stood in front of me, holding a vial in her mouth. With a flick of her neck, she tossed it over to me. I caught it in my hands. Behind her was Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo. They each wore a smile. They each turned their necks around, looking towards their flanks. They all sighed simultaneously, their grins turning down into frowns. You'll get them eventually, I reassured them. I pulled off the cork and closed the vial, getting a whiff of the fishy liquid. I steeled myself and drank it. I slid down in chunks, and that only made the taste worse. It was difficult to keep down, but I managed. The pain disappeared, but I couldn't move my wings. They stayed outstretched. I managed to limp home with Dashie's and Zakora's help. The cutie mark crusaders falling close behind us. We trekked through the forest, getting spooked along the way. Zakora wasn't phased by any of the sounds, yet the rest of us were. I thanked Zakora as we arrived at my cabin. She left to bring the cutie mark crusaders safely back to their respective homes. I opened the door, still waving back to every pony. I had a hell of a day. I just wanted to sleep. Dashie fidgeted with her dirty saddlebags. She held out a hoof towards me. Cupcake? she asked. I grinned and took the cupcake. They were a smushed, frosted, sugary lumps of dough. They were still amazing. Pinky had really outdone herself, as always. And we have yet another note from the author. I would have had this out earlier, but I was all night. But I was up all night watching Mike the Microphone's emotional breakdown last night until 2:20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
February 8th, 2012. Never forget the epic striptease. And for those who missed it, he put a link. Sorry for the short and rushed chapter. The next one will be longer and better, I promise. Chapter 14. Surgery. I have had my wings for quite a while now. All things, no matter how good, must come to an end. I suppose I should have learned that all those years ago when, ba when Dashie was brought back to Equestria. My wings are now molting, the feathers falling off more and more each day. Day by day, my gray feathers fall off until the day they are all gone. If I try to fly, I'm stuck with a horrible pain that starts cold in my neck, makes its way down in my back as the tingling pain amplifies and gets hotter. My tailbone feels like it's going to split at any moment. Sometimes my wings shake for no apparent reason. Sometimes I can't even fold them up. It's been long past a month, the time Zakora initially thought that I'd have these wings for, and I believe it's now time for them to be removed. I've made an appointment with my doctor. I should be having surgery in a few days. I've got nothing left to do with Dashi that I wanted to do with her, with these wings. I'm at peace with being flightless once more. I walked into the hospital with Dashi, knowing I would leave a changed man. In the waiting room, I saw the same pony from the bar I'd seen a few weeks before, with his little daughter and wife. I called his name. He called back mine, followed by a, Hey, what's up? We shook hands and hooves. His wife gave me a quizzical look. I sat down next to him, and he looked happy. His daughter looked happy, too, even though she looked ill. You're that guy! Dash's papa! She called out. Dashie walked up behind me, taking a seat next to the filly. Shortly after exchanging stories, one of the nurse called my name, having problems pronouncing it. I corrected her. Brian. She nodded, writing something down on the clipboard that she levitated. I sighed, stood up, and followed her into my room. Dashie couldn't come with me. No amount of begging would change that. I tried. I was falling asleep in the waiting room. I couldn't completely because I was so nervous. I felt a sharp pain in my chest, moving its way down my arm. The pressure only got worse. I got really warm, then cold, then warm again. I was shivering. This only lasted a few seconds before I heard a doctor shout, He's flatlining! in a faint scream, the gruff voice struggling to get the words out. Pops! I flew out of my seat. I didn't know where I was going. I flew blindly down the hallways, dodging ponies and wheelchairs and, stretching, and stretchers along the way. But... By some kind of luck, I managed to make my way through the right to the right room. I didn't even know if it was Pops who the scream was about. I just had a hunch. Pops was on his belly, face down. His back was covered in blood. He was twitching and sk he was twitching and shaking. His one wing still barely attached by a tendon. Stabilize! The gruff voice shouted again. Three of the doctors around Pops held down in his legs and arms. The unicorn held a small syringe with his magic. It was full of purpley blue liquid. He stabbed it into Pops, the plunger forcing it down into his bloodstream. The sight of it all was just too much. I fainted right under the door sill, whacking my head against the floor. The unicorn surgeon gave me an anesthetic. I was unconscious in moments. While under the knife, I saw something. Someone, rather. My mother. For the first time in over twenty years. I didn't see her for very long, and I, get, and I didn't get a chance to respond to her. But what she said to me left me stunned. I'm proud of you, she said. You've kept that wish of ours, the one to be happy. She reminded me. Ours? My father emerged behind her, then both positively glowing. He cleared his throat. Son, he began, I'm very happy for you. You didn't give up where so many others have. I felt a stab in my chest, then a tightness. I fell to my knees. I reached out towards my mother and father. They were cold. I felt myself float up, trapped in their frozen embrace. Something pulled at my leg. I looked down. It was Dashy. She bit at my pants leg, but I didn't stop moving up. It's not your time. Not yet, they said. I let go of my parents and floated back down to the white ground. The white around me faded to black. I fell back into the physical world. I gasped for air as I opened my eyes. I was surrounded by nurses and doctors. I heard the beeping begin again. I felt the pressure on my chest go away. The tension in the room melted away as a collection of sighs echoed through the room. The pain in my back came back, worse than ever. I want drugs! Now! I shouted. There's a faint snap, 
I feel unconscious from pain for the umpteenth time because of those wings. I woke up in the hospital ward. I was propped on top of an uncomfortable hospital bed. I had a needle in my arm. It fed clear liquid into me. There was a piece of plastic wrapped around my wrist. It led into a screen that displayed my pulse. The ambient beeping drove me insane. I was alone in the dark room. I heard a snore. Guess I'm not alone, I said in a near whisper. Something black moved in through the window, landing with a thud and grunt. I called out, uh, Hello? Who's there? I saw the dark figure move in the darkness. Shadows concealed, its exp Shadows concealed its expression as it walked up to me with its wings outstretched. Pops? Dashy? She removed her hood and reached down to hug me. They wouldn't let me stay. I returned the hug. Dashy stayed with me until Celestia's son rose. We heard hoofsteps echoing in the hallway. Dashy hid under the bed. The nurse, gave me, the nurse came in and gave me what was supposed to be breakfast. When she left, Dashi came out from under the bed. We hugged, and she flew home. She stayed with me every night that I was in the hospital. When visiting hours ended, she would leave the hospital for some time, wait until it got dark, and flew back into the open window. Chapter 15 Flashbacks I will forever have these two holes in my back as a reminder of happier days. Days of flight, mirth, and freedom. Occasionally, I still get the phantom pains, but they're nothing too serious. Only the occasional tingling sensation or abnormal warmth where my wings were. The doc said they'd go away within a few weeks, and for the most part they did. Still, once in a while I get the sensation that I have wings. As if they're still attached to me and that I can move them. Without my wings, I have gone back to other methods of flight. Mainly my long-since-abandoned projects, none of which have been successful to date, but only time will tell. I arrived home after some time recuperating in the ICU of the hospital. Dashie had visited me every day and night I was there. She was asleep on the couch when I arrived home. She had a turtle wrapped in her fore hooves. There was a small cone with a propeller and lightning rod on top of it resting on the floor. A small stack of about eight books were next to her on the ground. The top one had a green cover that read, Daring Do in the Quest for the Sapphire Stone. I went through the pile, trying not to make much noise. Another title was Daring Do in the Griffin's Goblet. The one under that was named Daring Do in the Legend of the Ruby Knight. Another was titled Daring Do in the Zebra Code. Dashi shifted around in her sleep. I stopped sifting through the pile. I walked over to the closet and searched for a blanket. I brought the blanket out and covered them both up, kissing Dashi lightly on the forehead. She squirmed around even more. Her eyes slowly opened. Hey, Pops, she mumbled, squeezing the turtle tighter. It moved around as she sat up. Who's the turtle? I asked, pointing to the shelled reptile. Tortoise, she corrected me. And his name's Tank. Isn't he awesome? She held him up to me. His head popped out of the shell. He gave me a huge, slow smile. I smiled back as best as I could. Uh, yeah, I said, not wanting to upset her. I'm sorry I couldn't be with the hospital when you got out. I took a seat next to her on the couch and hugged her. It's okay, Dashie. Don't sweat it. I glanced down to the books and, pe and picked up Daring Dew in the quest for the Sapphire Stone. What have you been reading? Is it good? Good? Try amazingly awesome. This book is undeniably, unquestionably, unputdownable. She took it out of my hands and flipped it open to the first page. She began to read aloud. We took turns reading through the night until we saw Celestia's sun rise over the horizon. By the time we had run the... By the time we had read the first book entirely, we were just about to start the second book, Daring Do in the Griffin's Goblet. The sunlight went through the barely cracked open blinds and cast a ray into the book as I was about to open the cover. We decided that we'd read enough. I stumbled down the dark hallway to my bedroom. My sight was stolen by a bright blur out the side of my eye. Rainbows. It was a beautiful painting, and it belonged to my mother. She had painting a rolling field that had a large parking garage near it. Over that, she painted an incredible rainbow. I fell to my knees, suddenly feeling weak and lightheaded. I took a deep breath and leaned against the wall. Dashi rushed over to me and began shouting for me. I couldn't respond to her. I could only watch as she panicked and my vision faded. My mind pieced together random memories from my time on Earth, much like it had done to me when Dashi was taken back to Equestria. I relived the walk that I had found the cardboard box on. I stretched my leg and accidentally tapped against the box, and I heard a faint yawn. The shaking box moved around. I knelt down to open it. The tiny cyan filly, six colors of her mane. 
a blinding contrast from the gray and drab outside. Hi there! The seven colors of her mane all turned white as she looked up to me, and I was taken to the night I first bathed Dashy. At the time, she was still small enough to fit into the sink. I see her scalding her tongue on the hot water, too hot for my little pony. I dipped my hand in to check the water and burned my fingers. I felt the cold bottle of water in my hand as I uncapped it and held it up for her to drink from. Instead of the crappy old tap water, she deserved only the best that I could manage. Seeing her covered in bubbles gave me an idea. I walked towards the other side of the kitchen and grabbed my camera. I told Dashie to smile as I grinned. She smiled and I snapped the picture. She shrieked and rubbed her eyes. I had to convince her that it was okay, that it was just a picture. After getting soaked by her trying to dry herself off by shaking, I dried off what water was left on her with, with a small towel and dried off my shirt. I placed her down on the floor. As she trotted into the living room, she turned to me and asked, Did Daddy, uh, are y you coming? I got another idea, something I knew that she'd like. I reached down and picked her up, holding her high above my head. She was flapping her little wings as if she was trying to fly. She began giggling, occasionally stopping to let out a wee as I walked around the room. My vision went white again. I was blinded by a rainbow. I was in a field, the sound of car alarms and cracking windows nearly deafening me as I covered my ears. I see Dashie descend slowly from the sky, the cloud and rainbow lightning mark on her flank. I smiled and embraced her into a hug. She looked confused, but returned the hug. A blur of white brought me a few hours towards the present. I was in my kitchen, covered in flour. The entire room was a mess of flour, vanilla, and eggshells. In front of me was a giant cake. Standing next to me was Dashy, her face beaming. Another blur shifted across my sight, once again bringing me only a few hours further in time. Dashy was laying in her bed. I had just tucked her in. I said goodnight to her, and she said it back. I turned around and began walking to the door. Just as I reached my hand to grab the knob, she said it. I love you. I stopped walking, stunned and confused as to what to say or do. I remember what my mother used to do when I was little. I turned around and walked a short distance back to her bedside, leaned down and kissed her on the forehead. Good night, my little Dashy. I love you too. She smiled and closed her eyes to sleep. A blink of white brought me about six more years towards the present, to a memory that I wish never happened. I had just gotten home from the grocery store. I set the paper bags down in the kitchen and walked out into the living room. I saw the te television. Yay, she did it! I heard Fluttershy shout. I dropped my keys, and the clang that they made got Dashie's attention. How long? I... How long have you known? I... Dashie turned around and looked at me. Her mane was messy, and her eyes were pink from crying. How long have you known about this? I felt a tear slide down my face. She had never yelled at me before, and you know what? I deserved it. I sat down on the couch, turned off the TV, and let Dashie ask and let Dashie ask me all of her questions. There were a lot of them. She flew upstairs after I tried to explain to her that she was different from the Rainbow Dash on the show. She slammed the door shut behind her. A few hours later, I went to check on her. I got no response. I leaned my ear against the door and heard the, f and heard the faint whistling of wind. I broke down in tears. Never had I cried like that in my entire life. The tear-covered floor went cloudy bringing my back to under the tree of one of the most heartwarming memories. I was crying under a tree when had, when had Dashi ran away. I was searching for her in the forest when I lost all my motivation to continue searching. I sat down under the tree, feeling the rain against my skin. I'm so sorry, I said. I'm just so sorry, Dashi. I heard the tree shake and crack. I opened my eyes to see a now nearly full-grown Dashi standing in front of me her coat matted in tree sap and burrs. She walked over to me, silently laying down. I felt her warmth. She looked terrible, yet beautiful at the same time. I... I heard you, her voice nearly a whisper, and I'm sorry too. I felt my face curl up into a smile. Dashy, you have nothing to be sorry about. It's my fault. Simple as that. She looked at me, sadness in her eyes. Dad, do, do you still love me? I reached out, seizing the opportunity, and brought her into a hug. Of course, Dashie. I've always loved you. I still love you, no matter what. Not even a small fight such as ours could ever change that. 
I feel the impact of every word as her face changes into a smile as she returns the hug. I close my eyes as tears made their way out. The back of my eyelids went white, bringing me into the most bittersweet memory that I have ever experienced. I only experienced it in bits, as the entire ordeal lasted quite a while. I was in my old home. There was a soft knock against the front door. I found Dashi sprawled out on my father's recliner. She was napping. I told her to hide in her room upstairs. I called to the door, asking who it was. May I come in? The voice replied. The voice grabbed my attention. Something about it seemed familiar, like I had heard it before. I turned around to see the last glimpse of Dashi's tail as she trotted up the stairs. I grasped the brass doorknob. Behind it was a regal figure of Princess Celestia. I felt my heart nearly stop. I took a step back and allowed her to enter our home. Close behind her was Twilight Sparkle, following after her the rest of her friends. I shut my eyes and shook my head. A blur of white streaked across the darkness of my closed eyes. I opened them, feeling the stinging of warm tears make their way down my face. I was on my knees. There was a rainbow mane tickling against my nose and as wetness leaked down my neck. Around my shoulder was a hoof. On the small of my back was a second. I love you, Daddy. And I love you too, my little Dashie. Her soft feathers glided across my arms as we forced ourselves out of the embrace. I looked around as I stood up. Every pony had tears in their eyes, even Celestia. Twilight fought back her tears and approached Dashie, her horn glowing in purple energy. I wanted to do everything and anything necessary to stop her, but I knew it was right. I knew that was where she belonged. Home. That may be true. She did not belong in my world. But in Equestria, she wasn't with who she belonged. Me. It pained me to know our time together was coming to an end so abruptly. I looked down at the floor. I didn't want to accept the fact that I was losing my daughter. Wait! I looked up. Before I go, I want to get something. She flew up the stairs before any pony could get word in edgewise. She came back down with a shoebox in her hooves. She placed it on the table. She wrote down something on a piece of paper. It was a letter that kept me sane through the depressed month that followed. It alone didn't fill the hole in my heart. The rest of the gap was filled with enough beer to cause me to go into a coma at least twice. I felt more tears fight their ways out of my eyes. I shut them to relieve some of the pain. When I opened them, Celestia was in front of me, her horn glowing in a golden color. She touched her horn to my head. I felt the warmth travel throughout my body. Thank you, she said. Every pony behind her then stepped forward, one at a time chimed in, and thanked me. Are you ready now, Rainbow? Dashie nodded. Twilight began focusing her magic. Her horn glowed in response. She bent her neck down as it tapped against Dashie's forehead, and everything went white as her magic activated. The room was different now. Everything that Dashie had owned was gone or different. I crawled into my father's recliner. The seat that was usually covered in cyan fur had been cleaned off of it. I stood up and made my way over to the window. I told myself that I wouldn't be mad, and that, that I would instead be happy, but I can't help myself. I yelled as loud as I could. My ribs cracked a few times as I shouted. It ended in a yawn. How can I be tired at a time like this? I took another breath and screamed some more, feeling only slightly relieved. I saw an old vase in the corner of the room, remembering how Fluttershy acted when she was upset. I kicked the vase. It exploded into a cloud of dust and sharp pieces of dried clay. I sighed as I walked over to the cold and wet window. I knocked my head into it a few times, trying to stop thinking, to stop remembering. The months that followed seemed to zip by me in an instant. I saw myself sitting under a tree one second. I had dreamed of that day when Dashi ran away, and I had gone into the forest to look to her, to look for her. I just wanted to hold her again, to know that she was okay. I fought for control of my arm, and I reached out for her wings. I had woken up with a feather in my hand the next moment. I don't know how much time had passed while I was asleep, or how I managed to grab the feather. That was the feather that brought me to Equestria, three times. Many times, I felt the coolness of a can in my hand, as I tried to relax and watch television, which was usually NASCAR or cartoons. I see the television, NASCAR was on. The screen gave way to a blue car that had a number 16 on the side. In my bus state, I began cheering for it, referring to it as Dashy. The car managed to win by, I don't know how, but it did. When the race came to an end and the driver jumped out of his window, he was asked how he won. He replied that he didn't know. 
It was almost like magic, he said. At that time I had many weird experiences, the feather being the cause of them all. I had stared at that screen for a while. It was as if the racer had been talking to me. I walked to the kitchen and got myself a glass of water, trying to wipe the taste of alcohol from my tongue. There was a plank that stunk up at the angle that, no matter what, every time I walked into the kitchen, it managed to trip me. Well, it had done it again, and I fell into my butt, the glass flying out of my hand and into the floor. I had gone to grab a broom and the towel to remove the glass. I had just dried up the water and swept up most of the glass into a pile to vacuum up when I saw a piece that had slid all the way to the television room. I walked over and bent over to pick it up. The room glowed a faint blue. I stepped in and saw the source of it all. The feather above the TV had glowed in the darkness. It drew me in. It floated above the television. I reached my hand out to touch it and it was gone. My sight went dark. This part of memory was a huge blur since the beginning. Remembering it didn't help me discover what caused it in the first place. I was in a room. The ground was dirt and all around me were masks and weird things that looked like witch doctor would own. I have long since discovered that it was indeed Zakora's hut. But what was even more confusing is that I heard a, a voice call out to me, Dad, it said. Dashy? I couldn't respond to her, only watched for the blurred sight as she tried to tackle me into a hug. She made contact with me. The rest is just blackness. I woke up with the feather in my hand. Its color had been sucked dry. It was a faint gray-blue color, like it had, like it had been used. Light ebbed in through the window. I see the light of the window fade to white as the hard wood under me turns to to dirt and leaves. Yeah, this is like my fifth time here, I said with a smug grin. I just wanted to rile the princess's royals fo I just wanted to rile the princess's royal feathers. In reality, it was only my second time. We had discussed the weather matters and time differences. With me crossing over, it only made the problems worse. I had to go back home. The two worlds actually begun to be dragged closer together with every time Dashi crossed over. It was all over too fast, as I was whisked back into Earth and left alone in my world. Nobody to care for. Nobody to love. Two days. For two goddamn days, I was back on Earth. Thank God it was the weekend. I drank so much that I nearly forgot it all. I just couldn't do it anymore. I wanted it to end. To be over. My sight went black, and in my lap was the open photo album. The page turned to Dashie's letter. It was still stained by her tears. I knew it entirely by heart. Dad, for fifteen years, you took care of me. For fifteen years, you loved me, played with me, and made sure I enjoyed a, my life in a world that was not meant to house me. I'm not a mayor of many words, but even though I told you this in person, I felt you needed a written version of it so that you would know it was all real. I love you, Daddy. You helped shape me into the mayor I am now. I'm not sure what is going to happen. If I remember any of this or not, but I want you to know that you did a darn good job of raising me, even if I was a bit stubborn at times and short with you during others. With Celestia's permission, I hope to allow you to keep our photos, our memories, with you so that you will never forget. Again, I love you and thank you. Your little daughter always. Your little Dashie forever. Rainbow Dash I read it again to myself. Tears were beginning to form in my eyes. It was the same as always, up until I love you, Daddy. You helped shape me to the mare I am now, but I need you again. Wait, what? I read the line again. It was different this time. I continued reading, my heart racing. I am sorry to say that I had to change the original note what I wrote for you those many days ago, but I needed some way to talk to you, and this was the last connection I have to home. I rubbed my eyes. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I continued reading. It is true that I am the element of loyalty, but how can I be that if I cannot be loyal to family as well as friends? So now, I leave you with a choice. With this choice, I uphold my loyalty, not only to my friends, but to you as well. Celestia has taken my power from me, and I no longer control the ability to bring you back to my world. I have locked my memories of you away, deep inside my mind, somewhere that Celestia will not be able to get at, but it will not last. My memories will come back if I see you again. It is how the spell works. Until then, the memories of the purple one, Twilight, gives me will be mine. And that is your choice. Enter Equestria and be with me, the one you raised, or choose not to.
and I will be the Rainbow Dash that was on the show. If you do come, I will be waiting by the lake near the forest, and this is important. I won't be there forever. I gave myself the idea that for three days equestrian time, I should go to the lake and relax. From what I understand, this gives you a little more than a month to decide. This paper now controls the last of my ability. Once that month fades away, the energy will too. And when the energy fades, the portal will close, either behind you or in front of you. Whichever one it is, is up to you, and there's no turning back. It'll close forever. Your little daughter always. Your little dashy forever. Rainbow Dash. My mind was racing to piece together what was happening. So many questions floating around with no answers in sight. She had given me the choice? She had learned how to control her magic? I took the paper out of the plastic housing. I felt the energy flow through it against my fingertips. But how to harness it? I grunted inside, trying to figure out how to activate it. Just listen to me. How can I be so selfish? How could I endanger so many lives just for my own selfish purposes, I thought. I wasn't doing it for me. I was doing it for Dashi. So that she could remember our memories. So that she could remember her pops. Still. How to activate it. Aha! I sprinted to the spent gray feather. I lifted the paper next to it. It floated out of my hands as a string of bright energy between the two formed. The feather glowed and its color had flowed up from the quill. The feather had returned to its cyan color. I took a step back, stunned that it had such a spontaneous reaction. But then, I heard Celestia's voice in my head. Your world was not meant to house her. I'm sorry, but that is the way it must be. I took a step towards the feather, and then, I turned around. The world around me faded and gave way to a green forest. I looked around for Dashi, knowing that she had to be near me. I walked towards the only source of light I could find, the setting sun. I emerged from the brush and saw the sand a few meters in front of me. I looked to see a pony beginning to fly away. I hid behind a tree as she turned her neck around. The pony landed and looked into the water. The water rippled under her reflection. She was crying. That's got to be her, I whispered to myself. I emerged from behind the tree and walked atop the sand, trying to be as silent as possible. I walked myself a few feet behind her, my, refle my reflection just visible in the water. Dashy, I said. She looked up. Daddy? We sat there on the beach, crying in each other's arms for a while, the sun setting in front of us. It started to get cold. Dash and I had just begun to get chills. I thought about going up to Dashy's cloud home, but I didn't want to risk it inside it in the sky, and I didn't even know if I could walk on clouds. Dashie was exhausted, and I didn't think she could carry me all the way up even if she wanted to, so we decided it would be best to set up a small fire pit deep in the forest. The house kind of built itself up from there. We set up the foundation within a couple days, and within a few months of labor, the house was done. I lived there for three and a half years in secrecy. Dashie had let it slip to Pinkie Pie that I had made it to Equestria, but she and Pinkie had Pinkie promised not to tell any pony. For a while, it all seemed too good to be true, and it was. I'd wake up, do a little fixing up around the house, look for some food in the forest, maybe do a little fishing, take a bath in the lake nearby, and wait around in the house for company. Well, one day, that company was some pony that I didn't ever, ever want to see again. By ways I still can't explain, Celestia had discovered me, and was furious. She nearly went solar flare on me. I swear from her screaming that I saw her mane begin to ignite at the tips. She tried and she tried, but she couldn't send me back. In trying to send me back, she did something weird. She turned me into a pony. Not for long. It was only a few seconds, but it happened regardless. She didn't seem to notice. Her eyes were shut in focus. I looked exactly the same way I appeared in the dreams Dashie and I shared. I was a pegasus with a brown coat, a short black tail, a messy black mane, and bright blue eyes. I panicked. I liked having fingers. I was surrounded by her golden aura within seconds and was back to being human. I sighed, then laughed at her and continued efforts. She was so out of her regal character, screaming and grunting at my snide comments, she even decided to use the royal canterlot voice, as Dashie calls it, on me when, she, when I gave her a particularly rude remark. After about an hour and a half of shouting, deep breathing, and focus, she disappeared in a flash of white and deafening screech. Seconds later, there was a brief flash and neatly rolled up scroll floated above the ground. 
I walked over to the steaming pile of paper and unfolded it. It read, Dear human, seeing as I cannot send you back to from whence you came, I shall allow you the privilege of living here in Equestria for the time being. It seems that the weather and time phenomena have been resolved, so there is no problem with you here. Do anything to harm my little ponies and you will regret it. The ponies will, no doubt, be afraid of you. Please do not give them any reason to fear you. Gain their friendships, and your stay here will be pleasant. She eventually disregarded me, and, for the most part, ignored my existence as long as I didn't do anything against her laws. With the news that I was safe, Dashie told the rest of her friends that I was here. For the most part, they were all happy. Twy had taken some talking to, and a letter to the princess, but she eventually came around. With Dashie and her, no, our friends' help. We had gotten enough money for me to buy a decent-sized cottage on the outskirts of town. Rarity insisted on making me some presentable clothes for the meeting. Without her, I'd have to wear the same clothes every day, which was why I brought f with me from Earth. A hooded sweater, a blue t-shirt, jeans, socks, underwear, and shoes whose sole had been worn down so much by walking. As I walked into town, wearing those fancy clothes Rarity had hoof-made for the occasion, I tried my best not to attract attention. Dashie found the town hall and helped me find my way. Inside, it was empty, but I still had to wait for a while to talk to the mayor. She was dealing with official matters and couldn't be bothered. I walked into her office and told her that the empty house I wanted to purchase. We came to an agreeable price. She huffed over the contract and I signed it. With Twilight and Big Macintosh's help, I got moved within a couple of days. The memories ended with Dashie in my arms as she crossed over the finish line of her first race. I gasped for air as I came back from the seemingly endless stream of memories. Dashie was shaking me. I hugged her as I awoke from the memories. Tears were leaking out of the corners of my eyes. As we let go of each other, I pinched my arm to make sure that I could feel it. I did. You okay, Pops? You know, you kind of scared me. Sorry, but how long was I? About an hour. I sighed as my mind returned to normal. I stood up from the rug as my ankles cracked and walked to the kitchen and got a glass of water. I drank it down and looked at Dashie. She had fear in her eyes. I hugged her and told her that we should get some rest. We both agreed that it was a good idea, considering we were supposed to an hour ago. Dashie lay down on her bed and got comfortable under the blanket. I lay down on my bed and did the same. Chapter 16 Boredom Dashie and I woke up around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We ate what was supposed to be breakfast together and just lounged around for the rest of the day. We had a large chunk of the second Daring Do book read by dinner time. We ate dinner as quickly as we could and went back to reading, eventually finishing the book late into Luna's night. We had started the third book, but fell asleep while reading. Dashie shook me awake. I opened my eyes, expecting to be in my bed, covered under a warm blanket. I looked down to see that some of the book's pages had been folded under my arm. I tried to flatten the pages as best as I could. Twilight won't be happy. I moved the book over to the small table that held a half-melted, unlit candle and, and a lamp. I covered my eyes with my left arm, and my and with my right, I pushed the button to turn the light on. Then she blinked a few times and shook her head as her eyes adjusted to the light. Come on, Pops, we gotta leave for practice in, like, an hour. She pointed to the clock that adorned one of the walls. She jumped into the air and pulled me off the couch and into my feet. She flew into the kitchen, searching to find something to eat. What are we going to do about reading, and how about the book? I didn't remember whose turn it was, or where we were in the book, neither did Dashie. We had decided that it would be best to reread the bit that we started later that day, once she got home. I was way too tired to go with her after the, or after the ordeal of reliving the last 20 years of my life. I just wanted to take it easy for a while. She didn't want to leave, but I convinced her that it would be okay. I thought about reading the third book while Dashie was gone, but I decided that I should wait for her to come home instead so we could read it together. I was bored out of my mind with nothing to do. I had at least a few hours until Dashie would be home, so I decided to visit town and see if I could find something to do. The first thing I did was visit Twilight to tell her about the book. Hopefully she could do something with her magic. I knocked on the door. Twi Twilight's voice called back asking who it was. I said it was me, and the door was surrounded by a familiar purple aura as it opened. I stepped into the library, holding the book tightly under my arm. It's nice to see that you're okay after the surgery, she said. Are you returning that book? I shook my head. I didn't want to tell her, but I had no choice. Dashie and I fell asleep while reading it last night, and um, a few of the pages got bent. I'm sorry. 
The book was shrouded in a pink aura as it floated out from under my arm. The cover opened and the pages flipped themselves through. A spark flashed from the cover. The book then floated it back into my hands. I flipped through it, seeing that the bent pages were now perfectly flat. Neat trick. I think Twilight blushed. It's kind of hard to tell with that purple coat of hers. She looked back down to the book, trying to cover it up. Um, anything else? She said in a quieter than usual voice. I thought for a second, then shook my head. I thanked her as I made my way out. I reached the new door, and as I was about to reach for the knob, I remembered that I would just be going home, and being bored for Celestia knows how long until Dashie got home. Hey, Twilight, I called out. I was answered with a soft, hmm? Do you need help with anything? It'd be really boring without Dashie home. I see Twilight look up from her book and shake her head from side to side. No, sorry. Spike and I just got done reorganizing the library, actually. You should ask Pinky. She can always use the help at the bakery. Twilight took a second to think. And if you don't mind a little bit of hard labor, I'm certain Applejack could use a bit of help at Sweet Apple Acres. She thought for another second. Also, Fluttershy could probably use some help with her animals. And Rarity always needs a bit of help around the boutique. I think Twilight again before I left. I stretched out my pants pockets to place the fixed book inside. I had decided to visit Sugar Cube Corner first, seeing it was closest to the bakery. A bell rung as I opened the door. I was warned by the scent of pastries. I walked to the counter and called out Pinky's name. She popped up behind me, nearly giving me a heart attack. I clenched my chest and sighed as my heart rate slowed down to a normal pace. Jeez, Pinky. She looked up to me with puppy dog eyes and a small smile. How can I be mad at a face like that? Got anything I could help with? I've got a few hours to waste until Dashie gets home, and I'm super bored. Pinky smiled as she pushed me into the kitchen. She put on an apron over me and tied it. She put a white chef's hat on my head. She showed me how to bake her Pinky Party Cupcakes, which were cupcakes with pink frosting topped with pink sugar. I ended up being done with baking at nearly 5 o'clock. I thanked Pinky, handed her her dirty apron and silly hat. She ran up the stairs with the apron and hat and came back with a bag in her mouth. With a twist of her neck, she tossed me a small bag. It jingled as it landed in my hand. Thanks, Pinky, but this isn't necessary. I've still got a lot of money left over from a bet. I handed her the bag back and thanked her for letting me do something instead of being at home, bored out of my mind. I opened the door and laid down on the couch, relaxing my tired feet. They hadn't felt like that in years. I rested my eyes and drifted off into sleep. The sound of the front door opened and shut, then a soft clip-clopping of hooves against the rug woke me up. I heard a faint humming buzz in the air. I opened my eyes to see Dashy. She was exhausted, yet she wore a small smile. Floating around her were two golden tickets. They each had some fancy print on them. Are those what I think they are? She nodded, her, her smile only getting bigger. Having been in Equestria for nearly six years, I have changed quite...